Hi, my name is Ann Elliott, creator and founder of homeschoolingtorah.com. Welcome to my home. I hope you'll grab a cool drink, pull up a chair, definitely get your Bible. This is session three of our 2022 Homeschool Family Conference, and today we're going to be talking about learning how to learn. I'm sure you've probably heard that I like to read. It's one of my favorite things to do, and I'm a typical mom, a wife, a busy, and I don't always have a lot of time to read, but I do try to read every evening, at least a couple paragraphs before I fall asleep, because that's what I generally do. But I love reading, and one of the things that I love most about Sabbath is that I have a little extra time to read and sometimes I don't fall asleep as quickly and usually the things I'm reading on Sabbath will keep me for the entire week and I don't just stick to biblical topics I study all kinds of things I really like to be well-rounded in what I read and so anything that piques my interest I'm usually sticking it on my list a lot of times I read books on my Kindle because um, I have that loaded as an app on my phone and it's got backlighting and so I can crawl into bed and snuggle under the covers and now you know why I fall asleep when I read. But over the course of a year I read a lot of books. Not as much as my friend Cheryl. She reads 200 books a year so she is so smart. However, I get through a few and so over each homeschooling family conference that you may have attended. My first one was in 2016 and we've almost every year had one. You're probably hearing me talk about various books that I really like and this year is no different. One of the books that was on my Kindle this year is called Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning and it has three authors, Brown, Rodiger, and McDaniel and I'm going to be referencing it a lot. Now these guys use cognitive psychology to study how children learn in schools. Now they're not Christians necessarily, I don't know what their beliefs are, but they did a lot of research it to see if what people say about learning is actually true and could be um, proven to work with children. And so they did um, a massive amount of research and testing their ideas, not just making up ideas, but actually trying them you know, in a real life situation. One of the things that I was blown away with when I read this book was how everything they said was already in the Bible. Like, you know, why do we read all these books on our Kindle when the Bible says the same thing? Now, I will say this, reading that and knowing what the scripture says, what I would read and then the things I'd read in my Bible, because I read that every single morning, that would come flooding back to me. So. It was kind of like a confirmation, another witness that, you know, our Creator really knows what He's talking about. In Luke 2, 52, we have a little glimpse into the life of Yeshua when He was a boy. And I think it's fascinating because at this verse, it's picking up, um, they have just come home from a trip to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. He and his mother and father, and I'm assuming his siblings, and as they come home, um, well, do you remember that trip? He went to the, to the temple and he was talking with the, the scribes and the priests and the Pharisees and they were astounded at everything he knew. And yet um, he came home and he was just an ordinary kid, except beyond ordinary because it says in Luke 2.51, he went down with his parents and came to Nazareth and he was subject to them. No ordinary kid is going to ever have that written about them in the Bible, that they were always subject to their parents. <laughs> and it says his, his mother kept all these things in her heart. And the thing that she noted in her heart's journal about his educational progress was this, and Yeshua increased in wisdom and stature, means he grew taller, and in favor with God and men. He had to increase. You know what's really fascinating about that? He I believe was God come down in human flesh and yet he had to learn as he gave up his deity to put on humanity he had to learn he didn't just start out smart he increased which means you can't increase unless you start at 
the bottom, right? You have to gradually keep increasing. So as he increased in wisdom and in stature, meaning he was eating a lot, just like any boy who's 12 years old. I have a 12 year old son who's five foot nine and a half, and he definitely eats a lot. I don't know how tall Yeshua was, but at my 12 year old, I'm seeing that he is increasing in wisdom as well. And I'm also seeing that he's learning how to get along with others. And of course, he's learning how to be obedient to his heavenly father. If Yeshua had to grow, you know, incrementally, little bit by little bit by little bit, we should be a little patient with our kids that they're all going to start out at a zero and have to have things added to. And I think that's so fascinating because I think one of the tricks as a parent is to help our children learn how to grow. Now, I mean, if, if we're growing in stature, it kind of happens automatically, but it does it. We, we provide the good sleep. We provide all the food and they grow. And yet for wisdom, we just sometimes expect that to happen automatically, but we have to nurture it. We have to feed it. We have to give it rest times and then we have to come back. Um, here at Homeschooling Torah, we talk about the stages of mental growth. Um, we talk about when children are young, they have to learn the facts. We have to memorize. But as they get older, they start to analyze and come back around to all those facts and really dig in and question how and why does that work? And then of course, as they become teenagers and as they go into adulthood, they're putting it into practice and even going beyond and teaching others. So um, we have come up with at Homeschooling Torah with four things and you're gonna see this throughout our curriculum. We call them hear, learn, keep, and do. And I put them into the lesson planning as I make new curriculum I actually have boxes down the side that say here, learn, keep and do just to remind me to put all of these elements into the curriculum. And the fascinating thing is in that book, Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning, he actually talks about all of these things. And I'm like, yes, Yehovah, you are just nailing it. It's so much fun. So these four things here, learn, keep and do. I'm going to read you the verse that I get it from. It's in Deuteronomy 5 verse 1. Deuteronomy 5 verse 1 says, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today, this is Moses talking, that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. So what is he going to give them? The statutes and commands. This is right before he gives them the Ten Commandments. Or actually, it's the second time this is in Deuteronomy, so he's reviewing the Ten Commandments, reminding them of those. But he says, First, hear, O Israel. So that's our first point, hear. And it means to pay attention, to draw your attention to something. Um, with a very small child, we know they're paying attention because they're looking at us. When you have someone's eyes, you have their attention. If you're watching this video right now, if you're actually looking at me, then you are paying much more attention than if you're doing projects around the house, stirring something, talking on the phone, texting, all of those things at the same time that you're listening to me, those that doesn't really work that well. You might catch a little bit here and be able to tell your husband, yeah, I heard her, I did. You know, do you ever tell your kids, did you hear me? And they're like, yeah, mom, I heard you. But you know they weren't really paying attention because they, you didn't have their eyes. So hearing is not just hearing, but actually letting that information come into our minds. That's the first step of learning. And that's kind of an obvious one, but it is why we emphasize having a good attention span with our children. If your children do not have any kind of attention span, they can't learn. For instance, when a child is learning how to count to 100, okay, they're really young. And huh, you get to about 17, maybe 23, Maybe for someone with good attention span, 31, 32, 33. What's that, mom? And it's kind of like our dog, squirrel, and they go running off. To get all the way to 100, to methodically count through, doesn't really take mathematical ability or smartness. It takes attention. They have to be able to get their mind to focus. So one of the things we do as a mother is we get a hundreds chart and we hold it up and we take our finger and we count with them one two three four five and it, we hold that finger across and if you see their eyes start to go across the living room while you're doing that you say okay look what's this next number and you ask them and they have to look of course and so their eye comes back and they're paying attention and they're hearing and 
it keeps them on track but it takes like muscle memory it takes work it's hard you have to keep doing it a little bit more every day. A little bit of a trick for increasing attention span is to actually set a timer on your phone. Your kids don't have to see this, but if you were able to count for two minutes on Monday, let's increase it to two minutes and 10 seconds on Tuesday and two minutes and 15 seconds on Wednesday and just gradually ever so slightly increase that attention span. But even beyond math time, you can do this throughout the day before you give them a direction or instruction that you want them to do something say look at me and then wait for their eyes to see you and then even ask them to nod their head or acknowledge verbally what you've said or repeat it back to you check that they are hearing you and your compliance levels will go skyrocketing this one simple trick is super helpful and another thing is to eliminate all other things that they are listening to now a simple example of this is when my children and I go to the grocery store say a young child is in the shopping cart or my seven-year-old is walking next to the to the shopping cart I don't let them go touching everything and I don't let them go wandering off and if they are just tempted by the things that their eyes are seeing I say fold your hands and they, they've been told this since they were babies. So they fold their hands and suddenly the attention has come back to what they're supposed to be doing. I don't care if they're 12 years old, I'm gonna make them fold their hands if they need it. That gives them a healthy dose of self-control and keeping the hands from going off into other things they should not and keeping the eyes where they should be increases attention greatly. So that's not all that's in that verse. Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today that you may learn them. And that word learn is very interesting because it's not what I expected when I looked it up the first time. The word learn means um, to goad. So if you have sheep and you want them to go in a certain direction or a cow or my dog for that matter, you might take a um, stick that you've picked off the ground and it's definitely not to hit them, but just to kind of give them a little nudge. Um, for my children, when I goad them in the grocery store, I might say, hold my hand and I'm going to lead them. So to goad is to kind of poke and prod and push in the right direction. And this is kind of those hints that you give your children, you know, so child, what is six times eight? And they, they, they're stuck. They can't remember six times eight. And you see their eyes going all over the room because they don't remember. And you, and you say, remember this six times eight is and see, it has a little bit of a rhyme to it. That's the way we learn it. Six times eight is 48. And just me sit, going into that little bit of a rhymey song thing with them, six times eight is, and that goading, that hint that I've given them, that little poke in a nice way, brings them right back and they almost always nail it as 48. That's why mnemonic devices and songs and things like that are super helpful. Charts on the wall, you can just point at a chart on the wall and just pointing to it triggers the memory and the children remember things. So that's how we go to someone. If, if you were to read this verse from Moses, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today that you may goad them, that you may be poked and prodded and nudged along by them and given hints and told which way to go so that you stay on the path. Um, the next one is um, that you may learn them, hear, learn, keep, be careful. Um, and I think this was from the NIV, but the word keep means to guard or to be careful is also that same word in Hebrew, to guard. So the word keep in English is most easily understood if we think of the keep of a castle. That is where they stored their foods and provisions and in the event of a siege by the enemy, that's where they put all their jewels and treasures and wives and daughters and anything that is very precious to them. That is put in the keep. And in this sense, hero Israel, the statutes and judgments, the things that you're supposed to be learning need to be put in a safe place so that they be, can be taken out again. In Psalm 119, it says, um, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So we hide it. The, the place that we keep our facts and knowledge and information is in our heart. And to get it from our brain into our heart, our long-term storage, we have to review over and over and over and over again. So we're going to talk a little bit about review today because it's such an essential part of learning. But that's what keep means. Here, learn, keep, or guard, or keep protected and safe. The last one is that you may observe to do them or that you may observe them. Um, NIV says to do them. So that's the end goal. 
what we really want for our children is not just to have a bunch of facts rattling around in their head, but we want them to be passed on to our grandchildren and to our great-grandchildren and to our great-great-grandchildren. Seriously, that's the end goal. I really think this is where Joshua's generation kind of dropped the ball. I think Joshua was a great person, but for some reason it did not get passed on to the next next generation so that by the time they all died as old men and the, the young kids were rising up to be adults, I and mean, this is several generations, right? They'd forgotten everything and it hadn't been passed on. So they have, you can't just review it and hold it in your own heart. You have to learn how to convey and give that information to the, ultimately the next generation. So the way you start with that is in your home around the table have them say it back to you what they've learned. Have them tell you, what did we learn yesterday? And they tell you, what did we learn last week? Do you remember that verse we learned last Sukkot when we were camping? Do you remember the topic we had at the dinner table at Passover last year? Do you remember what the Torah portion was three weeks ago? I mean, constantly bringing it back and having them say it to you. You know, as your children get older, um, they can make notebooking pages that show what they have learned. And then not only that, on Friday evening, when your family's all together around the table for Arab Shabbat, have your dad or have their dad look at the pages that they've made this week and have him quiz them and let them tell dad what they learned. When grandma comes to visit, tell grandma what they've learned. Maybe they could grow up to make a, a blog and so on. Maybe they could... Um, write for the local newspaper. Maybe they could join a debate team. Maybe they could learn to give a short um, testimonial or even devotional on Sabbath. So there are stages of mental growth that your children are going to go through. And this brings me to a topic I want to talk about really quick, and that is knowing what grade your child is in. Where do you place them in math? Where do you place them in, in the language arts? Where do you place them in history and science? How do you tell your friends honestly that my child is in fifth grade? Well, let's think about what grades really are. Let's not think about it how they are in the United States in 2022. Let's think about it what they were intended to be when people first invented the word grades. A grade is a level of difficulty. So think of it as a hill. Uh, my mother lives in Pennsylvania and there are some pretty large hills on those roads. And it says on the side what the grade of the hill is. What percentage of uh, increase are you gonna be making as your car tries to struggle up that big hill to get up to the top? Um, the, the higher the percentage, the higher the difficulty to get up the hill. So a first grade has you know, if it was a first grade hill, but let's go back to education. If it was first grade, it has a low level of difficulty. Kindergarten is almost like an introduction, but we, we'll start at first grade where they really get going. Obviously, 12th grade is going to have a very high level of difficulty, or it should. So, um, would you put your child just because he is 10 years old in fourth grade? No, it has absolutely nothing to do with his biological age, but just as Yeshua increased in wisdom and stature, he gradually went from one level to the next level in height. That is the same thing that our children should do in their grades. So they might be entirely different grades and different subjects, just for keep that in mind, but they often tend to be quite close together because they have overlapping skills. So um, if you're trying to put your child into a level, a grade of arithmetic, Go back to the level that everything is automatic. So for a kindergartner, it should be automatic that they can count to 10 by the time they're done with kindergarten. In fact, that's often a preschool level. So our preschool curriculum, the children can count to 70, but maybe not just off the top of their head with great attention span, but they, they recognize the number and they have worked with the number. By kindergarten, they're definitely doing 10 all the way up to 100, but Go and find the level that is automatic. So in our curriculum, you can access week 36 of any level. And week 36 reviews absolutely everything that they've learned that year, all in one week. And so you can look at that and give it to them as a sort of a test, not like a graded test, but just a, a way to assess what, you know, how difficult is it for them. And you should watch them take that. And if it's five days to get through it, then take five days to do it, it's no big deal. But watch them and note where are things really difficult. Did this make them cry? Was this so hard that it is impossible for them to do it? Did I have to help them every step along the way? Or was it so automatic that they were done with like the whole week and you know, no time at all and they're like, mom, that was easy. Then you might need to bump up. Um, so 
in our curriculum. We also have, at this time, we're working on, um, eventually down the road, we're going to have some new graded workbooks that have actually first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. But I don't want you to get so hyper-focused on the age of your child and what grade they're in. I want you to, to realize that this first level is um, could be done by any age. So you could have a child with learning disabilities at fifth or sixth grade and they could go back and do level one and two, first and second grade. It doesn't mean they're doing six-year-old work. It means they're doing the first level of difficulty and they should not be going on to the next level of difficulty until they have mastered this. In that book, Make It Stick, that I was talking to you about, The Science of Successful Learning, um, the authors talk about teaching someone to jump out of the airplane in the, mil in the military, they don't just get up on day one of basic training and go jump out of airplanes. There are so many skills that must be learned first and it does not matter if the person coming into the military has had any outside civilian experience. Everyone is going to be tested at the basic level and moved through. So it literally has nothing to do with the size of your muscles, how smart you are on an IQ test or how much experience you've had in life. Everyone starts at grade level one and has to move through. So go back to the level that is automatic. It doesn't matter how old they are or what that level is called. And then gradually go up one level at a time until you find the, the level where some effort is required but that you can build on previous knowledge. So maybe don't start them in the automatic one. They've got that down. Go up to the level where it has some difficulty but do not go up to the level that causes tears, or excessively long lessons, or they have no ability to recall. I do find that most fourth graders struggle in math, and I think that's because they're growing so much. Give them more snacks, just keep the lessons short. But do require some effort. Things are getting more difficult. The grade has gotten up, and you don't want our children to have life always easy. So it's okay if once or twice in, you, know, you have a child that cries during math, that's not the end of the world. I wouldn't fret about it or lose any sleep. That's somewhat normal, especially around that age. So let's say 10 to 12. But um, as a general rule, day after day after day, you should see your child's kind of um, stick to itiveness and ability to get through increase. I kind of gauge for my children using homeschooling tours arithmetic curriculum that their worksheets should take no more than 30 to 45 minutes. 45 is on a day where they're daydreaming and you might have to get after them to say, you know, let's stick on target here, let's keep going. But uh, working on their own, generally the lessons take 30 minutes or less. And that's a good gauge also to know if the, your child is working at the correct level. And if not, that's why you have access to all the levels and all the weeks. Just go and move them around, <laughs> go back, go forward. It's okay, you don't have to stick to a grade level. Um, Learning that they are, like some new learning that they're getting that day has to link to all of the previous things that they've had. And if you started a child who is, has no good foundation in arithmetic um, and you put them in fourth grade math just because they are that age, say 10 or nine or whatever years old, that is no logic whatsoever. They haven't learned the other things. You need to put them back and let them move at whatever pace is necessary to help them catch up. Um, that's for math. But what about other subjects? What about things like character? Like why are you worried about whether your child can spend money if you haven't even taught them good character? Like why are you giving them an allowance if they haven't even been trusted with something simple? What about trust as far as letting your child have free reign over his time when he hasn't been trusted to obey you? Um, what about responsibility? Giving them privileges when they haven't learned basic responsibility. What about um, attention span? Why are you expecting your child to read a chapter book if they do not even have the attention span to count or to read the reader that you assign them in word power? So um, it's kind of like a funnel. At the beginning, the things are simple and you would gradually increase the difficulty and the joys and privileges and the ability and the things that they can do. It's so more, more responsibility means more privilege. But you would never want to start by shoving someone out of a plane the first time that they go into basic training. That would be a little much, but that's what we do a lot with our children. Scoot them back and pay no attention to grades. 
Um, reading and writing is kind of obvious as well. Don't just because of a certain grade put them into a certain reader or a certain level of difficulty. Don't expect them to write paragraphs if they can't even get their handwriting legible or if their hand cannot handle writing that much, you're gonna work on it. I'm not saying never give it to them, just tells you where you need to start and these are the skills that you need to work on. Other subjects, such as science and history, sometimes you could start almost anywhere there. You could start with any topic, but you're going to need to tailor the assignments to the skill level and attention span and endurance of your child. Um, here's a basic gist of let's say doing notebooking pages. You want your child to do a notebooking page. Our curriculum says do a notebooking page, but it doesn't say what you're supposed to put on the notebooking page. And I get a lot of emails saying, I don't know what I'm supposed to have my child do. Well, it depends. And this is something that I'm gonna help you learn today. But it just depends on your child. What are his or her abilities? Push them just a little bit to have some effort required to learn, but not a lot, okay? so. For a young child, they would be, well, I'm gonna say young, but see there I'm putting it into a stereotype. It just depends on, oh say, for a child with low ability, there we go. The hardest thing for them is to just listen at all to what you were reading from the book. Um, Christine Miller's history books, sometimes there are pages that are dry. I mean, she will always tell you how wonderful they are, but we all know some days are just more dry and boring than other days. Maybe we're not as interested in the topic. Maybe our children have not had enough sleep or they're just not paying attention as they should. So the most basic skill that you want to give your child is to listen, right? Hear. To hear, learn, keep, do. We don't start with the do. So first of all, ask them, what did we just read? If your child cannot tell you back what they have read when you get to the end of a chapter, then you need to go and make it easier. At the end of a paragraph, stop and say, what did you just learn? Tell it to me. And that's a kind of a boring way to say it. You could have some fun with this. You could say, now, if you were talking to your friend, Benny, what would you say right there? How would you explain this to Benny? Okay, so um, you don't have to always be boring when you say this. You could, um, at that point, you could stop. And, and maybe that should be the lesson for today if your child is young. You don't have to stick to the number of days in the curriculum. Um, you could say, okay, tell me what you just heard. Will you draw it as a picture? Like that would be especially helpful if there are some people in it. And you might say, they might say, I don't know what King George looks like. And you're gonna say, okay, let's pull up with my phone. Let's look on Wikipedia and find if we can get a picture of King George. And then we'll have an idea. Was he wearing a wig? Did he have a big nose? You know, even a small child can do simple details like that. But listening and then telling back to talk is the next level and then to draw or be able to put what you have learned onto paper. So as we were talking in our earlier session, the alphabetic skill of writing is much higher than just to draw, to draw a picture. Pictographic learning is not as high of grade level as using words and complete sentences and then paragraphs and essays and research papers. Obviously that is much more difficult and much more higher level learning skill I don't even like that term, but it is much more of a, it's more like our creator to be able to create with words and not just pictures. So listening, talking, drawing, writing, and the writing, there's a huge, you know, level of difficulty increase that you can put there. As they get older, you are going from here, child, I'm going to write a sentence under your picture and then I want you to trace it to your 12th grader saying, you know what? Um, in three weeks, I want you to give me a five page paper and I want it to be double spaced and typed and I want you to use um, Chicago um, style citations, okay? So, it, obviously there's massive levels of difference here. So in the curriculum, it'll say, make a notebooking page. Um, for you as the mom, your challenge is going to be to find the level of where is it automatic for your child? Where is it in tears difficult? And get that sweet middle where it's, it has some effort required, but it's not horrible, <laughs> okay? Um, goodness, if you even wanted to go further than that, you would require your child to give a presentation and actually speak it out in words in front of an audience, but that would be even more difficult.
Okay, so learning how to learn. How does your child remember everything that you've taught them? We're gonna talk about that in a later session. We're gonna go back into grading and assessing so you can report this to someone else, but I'm not gonna talk about that right now. I'm just gonna talk about you and your children. You're sitting with them at home and you're trying to help them remember and learn. Okay, nobody's crit critiquing or you're not turning this into anyone. This is just you. You are the teacher. You're looking in their eyes to see if they're looking in your eyes. You get what I'm saying? So, first of all, um, there are some things that we think work because of probably the way we were schooled and research shows they don't really work. So, I want you to keep these in mind. Uh, my daughter is in college. She has gone through one year of college and it has been fun because she's more talkative to me than her older brothers were when they were in college. And so she talks to me a lot more about how she's learning and what she's doing. And it's been interesting because she's tried some of these methods in college and they didn't work for her either. And I was just telling you about how I read books before I go to bed and I tend to fall asleep. Um, but the first thing people try to do to learn something is just to reread the whole thing again. Maybe you've been working with Christine Miller's book. Maybe you're reading Story of the Ancient World and you're, now let me pick a different one, a little bit more difficult. Story of the Middle Ages. I find that one a little bit more difficult at times. Sometimes I get lost where I'm at. Am I in England? Wait, did she move to France? Wait, wait, where am I at? I wasn't paying attention when she told us. So rereading it is what I think I should do, but research shows that isn't necessarily the best way. Me. This is another one I do. Oh my goodness, you should see my Bible. You should see all the books. Even on Kindle, I can do this. But I highlight and I underline. My husband does it too. Oh, we turn all the corners over. Don't tell anyone what we do. We turn the corners over or I put sticky notes in and sometimes I have like 50 sticky notes in a book before I'm done. And does that actually help me learn? Not by itself, no. Research has said that no, that doesn't actually work. How about concentrating for hours you know what reading for hours or having a really long science lesson with your children it has been proven to not actually be effective how about cramming so my daughter will have a test it's going to be this coming thursday at 9 a.m she has a lot of other things going on in school as well and so wednesday night she's going to just flip through her book and try to find everything she ever highlighted and cram it all into her brain all of these things because they do take time and you have effort of using your hand to highlight and so on, give the illusion of learning, but you're not actually learning. And, and maybe you have some small pieces that you're absorbing, but there are better things. See, none of those things, highlighting, <laughs> highlighting in my Kindle where I just have to press it with my finger and move my finger to what I wanted to remember, doesn't really require any effort. And we've just been talking about that. You want your child to have to to have some effort, not too hard, but some effort. He calls it in the book, desirable difficulties, okay? Because maybe it's something you actually want to learn. And some of the reasons that as adults, we learn things better than even as children is because we actually chose to learn this. But there are things we have to learn anyway. So we also have to choose for our children and say, no, we're going to learn this. I know you need it for life, but let's make the lesson fun um, while it is difficult. So here are some ways we can do that. Here's some effort. When you quiz your children, you could do like schools do and give them a multiple choice test, or you could just ask them the question and make them search around in their brain without any hints or, or multiple choices or word banks to look at and actually just answer the question. So for instance, in what year did Christopher Columbus sail the ocean blue? You could have a, a multiple choice and it could say uh, 1500, 1492, 1776, 1985. And your child could pick from that. And they're likely going to pick 1492, or maybe they won't. But I'm saying don't do that. Just ask them, what year was it? And they're gonna go, um, I don't remember. And now the effort will have to start. You're gonna say, well, it's in the book. Do you remember where we were yesterday? I keep a little sticky note as my um, bookmark in my history books and we're reading so they can get the general idea. Make them look for it. Make them search. Make them find out. You could give hints, like I gave a hint even when I did that. In what year did Columbus sail the ocean blue? Does that bring back that little rhythm and rhyme that you learned as a child? Um, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. I can't even say it. 
He discovered the new world in 1492. I don't think I did that right. So you can put it in the comments what it's supposed to be, but see how it, it rhymes with each other. So I gave a hint, but I still am requiring effort of the student. Constantly raise the bar. So if today I gave them that hint, tomorrow I'm going to expect it to be a little bit quicker, the recall. Um, get it a little bit more difficult. Um, so maybe on Friday evening at Erev Shabbat, I'm just going to cold turkey, not even in the context of history, say, hey, Johnny, tell Dad what year Columbus discovered the New World. I didn't give a rhyme there. I just cold turkey. We're eating, we're eating dinner. And he's like, hmm. And Dad's going to want to give him the answer, at least in our house. Dad will be like, eh. and you're like, no, no, no. And then hopefully you'll get 1492. And then just continually increase the difficulty. So then wait a month. In a month from now, he should have surely forgotten it, right? That's a good time to bring it back. That's difficult. And see if he remembers. This is one of the reasons in our history curriculum we have reminders for you to go back over the timeline dates that you've been learning. And sometimes it'll say, go back over all the ones that you've been learning for the whole year. But you don't even have to stick to that. You could just randomly decide, today we're going to pull out the timeline book and I'm just going to flip open to any page that we've already put the dates in there and pasted the pictures. Let's see if your child can actually remember it. Of course they won't remember most of them. So then you're going to have to give them a little assignment to go digging for it. Make it where they have to work for it. Okay? Help them to continue to review until they have demonstrated mastery over the subject. I have a little rule of thumb for grading in my home, and I'm going to go back um, onto this when we come back to the subject later in the week. But... Um, I want the goal for all of my children to graduate with straight A's. And I'm going to make them earn it, but that doesn't mean I only test once. And if they didn't do very good, oh well, they got a C today. On to new territory. We have lots to cover this year. Hogwash. Go back over it until they actually know it and can remember it for an extended length of time, hopefully their whole life. And no, I'm not perfect at this. And no, if you meet my children some to coat or whatever. You'll find that they have gaps where I did not do this perfectly. But that's my goal, is to help them learn it until they know it and to keep coming back to it until uh, we aren't satisfied with B's and C's around here. I want them to have a good 90% or higher. I want them to have an A. Gracious, I reward greatly for scores of 100. I'm so happy about that, but even that doesn't mean they know it. Come back again months later with a cumulative review. And no, our curriculum does not put all of these tests in. Why? We've talked about putting some in in the future so that you can do it, and I might, to help you out. But what I really want is for you as the mother to know your child. You know, keep sticky notes and little post-it notes and notebook paper handy in your teacher binder. And when you find that a child is weak on something, make a note to yourself. And then you can have that little bit of sticky note tick, um, sticking out past the edges of your paper. And you can come back and you'll find all the things that your child needs to review. Same thing would be true in spelling. Did you see a word that they misspelled? Then have a personalized spelling list for your children. Personalize their, their instruction. You're the only one that can do that, Mom. You can do it better than anyone else. You should also mix up their practi the practicing that they do. And in this book that I've been talking about, Make It Stick, they talk about how that's called interleaving. I'm never going to remember that word. Maybe I'm putting it in a video, but I have notes. To me, it just means mix it up. Don't always be so predictable. Predictable things aren't learned as well. So, for instance, um, always having the same kind of math problem in the same kind of order on the page. It might look like you did 50 problems uh, that are all the same, and so 50 problems should help you learn it, right? But that's not what the research shows. Maybe have three problems, and then mix it up and have three different kinds of problems, and then mix it up and have six of this, or even better, mix up story problems and arithmetic or um, multiplication and then and then throw in a division and throw in a percentage and mix it all up and make the brain go searching in all the different parts of the brain and and it has been proven that the child will learn it better and it just makes sense now what this lends itself to is a lot of discussion as a parent again know your student look over the page the worksheet for the day and before you just hand it to them you might just point at any random problem on the page and have them do it with you on the whiteboard um, and that's mixing it up um, 
don't want to be predictable. Predictableness means that your child has guessed what's happening and they're not learning. There is a place for that, especially when you're learning a new skill, you want to do it a lot. But we've just talked about spacing things out. You know, in time, maybe tomorrow you might want to come back to it and your child is not going to be expecting it. It's not predictable at that time and it is proven that they will learn better. I think I've said in previous videos about my mom, how she used to quiz me on my multiplication tables. I'm not the best at arithmetic as far as just knowing things off the top of my head, but she would really try with me. Spelling was another one that I wish, you know, I could have done better at, but she would just quiz me as we were drying dishes. And sometimes she would be like this. So Anne, how was your day today? Who did you play with? Oh, did you ever get your bike fixed? You need to talk to your dad about that. By the way, what's six times eight? You know, that is not predictable. Other times she was predictable. She would just put up, you know, um, she would think to herself, okay, she's washing dishes right now and I'm drying because she always made me help or my brother. And she would be like, okay, what's one times three? What's two times three? What's three times three? What's four times three? What's five times three? And th then we'd get through that whole times table, all the, all the threes. And then she would say, okay, do you remember what seven times six is? No, I don't. But it, I always felt like it was terrible at math, but I think that was such a fantastic way to reveal. The key is she didn't have a curriculum in front of her. She was being a mom. She was looking at me and saying, I could help with this. Let's, let's personalize this education. Let's mix it up a little bit. In arithmetic, in our homeschooling tour arithmetic, this is one of the reasons we give you two parts, and I hope that you'll use both of them. Boy, it's getting windy out here. I hope I'm not yelling at you. Um, the first part is the math drills. These are in the teacher guide, and you have to print the teacher guide, and you have to actually look at it in order to get these, but they are all over the place, all kinds of review, and the kids can get up and moving and doing things, and that gives that, that unpredictableness and then they get their worksheet. But even on the worksheet, we do what is called a spiral learning, which has been proven to reinforce and increase mathematical learning and memory over the long term. So we teach a new concept, but then we always review and review what has already been learned. And it is, here's another mind blower. Flashcards are proven to help children learn. Why is that? I don't know. It's the way the father made us. I think it's that testing. You know the father tests us too, right? <laughs> um, there are times that we think we know something until we're tested. We have illusions of learning. I have a train going by, and so this is a good time to remind you that we have a rule for our homeschooling tour conferences, and then I'll cut out so you don't have to listen to the train. It's gonna blow again. So this is a good time to remind you that because a train is going by during our video, we have a coupon for you and it's available right now in the chat. So hopefully that will be a blessing to you. And now I'm going to wait until that train goes by. So we were talking about how sometimes we can fool ourselves. We have the illusion of learning. We think we know everything there is to know about a, a topic, but we actually don't. Um, you know, incompetent people are not aware of everything that they don't know. And that goes for all of us. I think I know a lot about something, especially cooking. I think I'm a great cook. My husband, who actually is a good cook, will try to teach me something and I can feel myself going, Ugh. I know what I'm doing. Don't tell me what to do. <laughs> um, incompetent people are not aware of what they don't know. Your child thinks he knows everything about math. Or we're just using math as an example. I hope you'll apply this to everything. One of the reasons flashcards are so valuable is they check for any spots that are weak. Um, I think we all do this. It doesn't matter whether it's Hebrew learning and we have to have flashcards and we think we're really good at Hebrew and we're doing really well at it until we pull the flashcards out and we find out there's a big hole where we actually weren't paying attention and we don't know that very well. Testing reveals where we're fooling ourselves and as parents it is our obligation to test and I want to read a passage to you Hebrews 12 uh, verses 3 through 13 and it says 
For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. So we think, you know what, I've got that down. I know how to not sin in that area. But um, have we really resisted to the point of death? In other words, has our level of difficulty, has our grade level been increased all the way to 12th grade in a certain area of sin? Probably not. So what is the father going to do? He says, you have forgotten the exhortation that speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of Yehovah, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom Yehovah loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, and I think in this illustration for school, we're talking about that prodding and poking and reviewing and testing and using flashcards and doing all the other annoying things that your children would really rather not do because they would like to go play video games. But if you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? If you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you're illegitimate, not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. That's how it should be. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection, subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Remember I said Yeshua was subject to his parents when he came home from Nazareth at age, or to Nazareth at age 12? He was chastened, and I don't mean that he was naughty, but his parents had to teach him. He had to increase level by level by level. For indeed, for a few days chastened us. They, in, they indeed, for a few days chastened us, as seemed best to them, but he always for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Here's a key verse. No chastening seems to be joyful at the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. I really get a kick sometimes out of watching videos on YouTube about various um, kids as they go off to start basic training. So there's one series on, on YouTube where um, these, these cadets um, are going into the Air Force and they are enduring chastening. Why? Because the military hates them and wants to tell them that they're worthless? No, it's because they want to improve them. And so they work on those hard things and they test them in a multitude of ways. It is, I'm not talking here about a multiple choice test that is graded in an A as put at the top. I'm talking about checking the knowledge of your children naturally all throughout the day. Um, always be skeptical of what you know yourself. Check it. Flashcards are an easy way. Have someone quiz you. Be humble and willing to listen to those who want to instruct you and teach your children to do the same. Let's talk about learning styles. Are they legitimate? I have a video on learning styles. I think there's a lot to be learned from learning about learning styles. Whether you talk about I'm a visual learner, sorry, or an auditory learner or a kinesthetic learner, which I want to go and get hands on. There are legitimate things about that. You naturally are better at certain styles of learning and so are your children. It is very tempting as homeschool moms to keep all the learning in that learning style, but that's not checking our children. So if they're very good at listening to a story and repeating it back, check sometime that they can also learn by watching a video, which would be visual. Um, I'm not as good at learning hands-on. I'm much better at visual and reading or watching something than I am at um, having to go put together a um, kit with instructions. I'm not that mechanical. That's an area I need to work on. So here's the thing about learning styles. You don't want your child to only be able to operate in one area of strength. You want your child to be able to be like Yeshua and to increase in every level to be completely well-rounded. That's your goal. You want to acknowledge their strengths, yes, but you want to focus also on boosting the potential of their weaknesses. Basically, um, as, as researchers, including the ones in this book, have looked at learning styles, they have found that it makes no difference whatsoever to the ability of a child to learn. It's fascinating because that's not what I used to think, even 20 years ago. They've also found the same is true with IQ. Uh, just because someone's IQ is low does not mean that they can't learn. They can learn just as good as someone with a high IQ. They just have a weakness in an area that it needs to be cultivated and strengthened. The brain 
grows over your entire lifetime. Just because your child is 10 does not mean that they would never learn to read if they can't read right now. No, they could learn to read at 80. Your brain will never stop learning and growing and the research that has been coming out even since homeschooling tours started in 2013 shows continuously that the brain is very neuroplastic, constantly gr growing and gaining in ability if you exercise it. So no excuses, mom. Say, I can't teach my child. You know, he has ADHD. Don't blame anything. Don't give excuses. You know, so what, they have Asperger's. So what, they, so they have autism or they're left-handed or um, they have allergies or that you're, they've gone through a divorce or even abuse. So what? Hard things increase learning. Your child actually has the potential to learn more than a child that everything came easy for. Just grab that. And I want to go back to Hebrews 12 on this just to prove to you that God thinks the same thing. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2, which I skipped intentionally. I started at verse 3 last time. But verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, every ADHD, every disability, and let us, and the sin which so easily ensnares us. You know, my child can't pay attention. They're disrespectful. But let us run with endurance. The race that is set before us, looking unto Yeshua, the author and finisher of our finisher, can I say that? The author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Has your child got a learning disability that big? Despising the shame, and he sat down, he, he conquered, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Yeshua is to be our example. And it's cr pretty incredible to me, but amazing to me how often we do not urge our children to have endurance, but instead we give them a cap out and an excuse and we blame the reason that they don't know something on some circumstance. And yes, that does make it difficult. We all acknowledge that. And it is useful to find out if there is a problem so that we can be more understanding and patient and gentle, but do not let it be an excuse for not doing the work, for not enduring. Does it help your child to be an early learner? Well, research says absolutely. Teach your children earlier the better. I'm 100% an advocate of early learning. Early teach your children to have good attention and to listen and to be obedient early. I mean really early. My rule of thumb is about five months of age. Your children should be learning to pay attention, to obey, to increase their attention span, to do what you say. And there are, that's a whole subject that you can look into our preschool curriculum and find lots of tips for. So yes, I'm an advocate for early learning, but research says that it doesn't actually matter what age you start learning. You can still learn it. So for instance, children here in Michigan in a low socioeconomic status, we have a few of cities like that here, they tested their IQs and then as they do as researchers, they tested how children could learn and grow from those baseline IQs and they was, were young children and they found out that when they had teachers who gave them consistent daily lessons, didn't matter what that starting IQ was, they learned. When they had tools like books and puzzles, it didn't matter what that baseline IQ was, they learned. And here was the key one which blew my mind. When their mothers were trained to talk to the children, these are preschoolers from very poor homes, when the mothers were trained how to have conversations with their own children, they grew like crazy. Their IQs were whew, what does it say in the scriptures? Deuteronomy 6, 7 through 9. You know I love this verse and hopefully you can say it along with me. It says, Hear, O Israel. Well, I'll start in verse, eh, let me go to actually down to verse 6. These words which I command you today shall be in your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your children and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Scripture verifies 
what scientific research has proven, and that is that um, conversations with your children at all times of the day boost their IQ. Imagine that, a creator actually knows what he's talking about. So who else can do that as well as you? If you didn't even have a lesson plan, having conversations at all times, at night before bed, as soon as you get up in the morning, when you're driving around in the car, I, I substituted that for walking, but definitely when you're out in the garden working or walking around the house putting away laundry, or when you're sitting on the couch, instead of grabbing the remote control to just watch something and let someone else instruct your children, you have those conversations. And if you are gonna watch something on TV, say YouTube or whatever, pause it and have a conversation with your child about what you learned. Mothers, be trained to talk to your children from birth, from pregnancy, goodness. Also, it says to bind them on your hands. What does that mean? I really was thinking about that as I was putting this together. And when you, when you go into Ezekiel chapter four, it talks about people who had a mark. It was on their foreheads. Um, but when you put a mark on your hand or your forehead, think of the mark of the beast. Is it a literal thing? Or is it that person has made a choice and a commitment that their hand will do what their mind instructed them to do? It's very fascinating that right behind the forehead in the frontal lobe is where we make our choosing decisions and on our hands carry out the instructions that that part of the brain gives them. That is so fascinating to me because you can have all the curriculum in the world and you can have all the instruction given to you by those who love you you can read books and watch videos, all kinds of things, but until you make a choice that your frontal lobe says, body, this is what we're gonna do, and then you do it, until you bind it there, you will not change, and neither will your children. So you can instruct them, but help them to bind his commands especially, but all the advice and good counsel that you give them day to day as wise mother, Make sure that they make that choice. Help them make that choice. Help them say, so when it's a small child, you can say, I want you to go over there and I want you to grab a fork for mommy and bring it here. And the child is sitting on the floor playing with Legos when you say that. And the child could make a choice. Um, remember I said to have them look at you, so you would have been better to have, say, Susie, look at me. Susie looks at you. Or even better, train them to as soon as you say their name, that's the automatic thing they do is look at you. You know, if you have a little baby, you can teach them by gently turning their head towards you or making a cute noise and smiling. Those things train your child to look at you. As Soon as you say, Susie, she looks at you. Susie, I want you to go grab that fork for mommy. So Susie now has to make a choice. Will Susie bind on her hand and forehead that she is going to obey her mommy and go get the fork? You can help her along, see Susie, what did I ask you to do? And now her frontal lobe is going to command her tongue and she's gonna say, mommy, you said to go get the fork. And then you say, are you going to obey? And she has to say yes or no, but she's thinking it through and she's likely to say yes, mommy. And she's, as soon as she says that, she's nine times out of 10 gonna get up from the Legos, go over and get the fork and bring it to you. And you're gonna give her a hug and you're say, thank you. And that's how learning happens because they bind it on their head and on their, on their hands and on their forehead. It says to put it as frontlets between your eyes and to write it on your doorposts and gates. So you're to put reminders everywhere in random places. I love reminders on my phone that pop up at times I'm not expecting them because they bring back the information that I've been thinking about to my mind and I am reminded to go do, <laughs> right? Um, we talk about in our curriculum several different things that you can do to increase learning and then we're going to get through these and then be done. We talk about notebooking. Notebooking is super important. I've touched on it already but here are some things that you can do in the notebooking. You can have them write down what they learned that day. You can have them explain what they learned. You can list out step by step the things that happened or all the people mentioned or all the dates or all the countries that we've been in or in science you might list out all the properties of um, let's say water, okay? You might draw a picture of a dinosaur and you might draw a picture of how the flood could have burst the continents um, as it, the water burst out from the, the chambers that were underneath the earth in this massive amount of pressure and shot out into space. 
um, that would be a cool thing to try to draw a picture of. You can tie it to previous learning. When you get up in the morning and you sit at the table and you get ready to start school that day, you can say, hey, okay guys, what are we talking about in history this week? And you're gonna get the typical, I haven't had any coffee, mom, because I'm only nine and I, I look like I could use coffee and I have no idea what we talked about yesterday. But other days, they're gonna immediately launch into it. And it, um, as you come to something in your reading, you can stop and say, Oh guys, so that place it's talking about the Cumberland Gap right now and all of the people, the, the frontiersmen who went through that and forged a road and you could say, do you remember when we were traveling and we went through the Cumberland Gap and we stopped and they're going to go, oh, that's the Cumberland Gap and, and suddenly you've tied it to previous learning and they do remember. Um, and you review, review, review. As the verse said, you review when you sit, you review when you walk. You review when you lie down and you review when you rise up and this is why no curriculum can tell you all of these things it's going to become a manner of life and yes we're going to give you tips and reminders but you are going to have to personalize it for your children you know it's i like um, even doing things like getting fun little worksheets printing them off the internet for free putting them in a page protector with a dry erase marker and having the kids fill out the worksheet then cleaning it off and putting it away for a random day that i'll pull it out again and they can do the same one again worksheets are fantastic for all kinds of reasons but you don't have to go down them in the order that they say i'm, I'm granted they did put them in the order they are for a reason <laughs> But you don't have to do that because you're personalizing the information for your children and you can constantly quiz them over previous learning and when they can answer a quiz give them a reward and they'll be more likely to want to take that quiz the next day and again i'm not talking about quizzes for grades i'm just talking about quizzes where you are trying to help them cement that learning um, reviewing after a child actually does take a test reviewing the test with them and if there were any areas that they had trouble let's go over it let's talk about how to do it correctly what would the right answer be and then maybe later put that question on a new test so that they can kind of have that sense of accomplishment that they they got that wrong last time my daughter says in college when she gets something wrong in a test and then goes back to her dorm room and looks up the answer in her book she almost always remembers that one better than the ones that she got right and didn't really have to work for Ask your child, instead of t telling you who did something or what they did, ask them to tell you why they did it or how they did it. You can think of those six serving men we learn about in our, in our writing curriculum, who, what, when, where, why, and how. We, we tend to often stick with what happened and who was it. Branch out into the when and where and why and how. Um, and it will be a lot easier for children to cement that. Um, ask them to explain back to you what they've learned. We've talked about that already. So you see all these variety of methods. Space these things out in a variety of fun ways that you're going to be thinking of all the time because you're going to be a good teacher and you're going to learn how to be a good teacher. Um, space things out over days and weeks and months and years. Again, use those sticky notes. Um, learning like this can feel slow. Like it feels like you're not getting anywhere. You know, like, it's not the same as finishing a book. But learning like this is deep. It's like a tree putting roots down. And it deeply goes into the ground. Day by day, you can't see that learning is happening, but it is. Learning like this needs a schedule. You're going to need the sticky notes. You're going to need a curriculum. You're going to need something to tell you this is what needs to be done today. And then you have to discipline yourself to stick to that schedule. Learning like this while I'm telling you to review while you sit and walk and um, rise up and all of those times, you also need a schedule. You need to be intentional. You cannot just be random about this. Yes, a lot of people do unschooling, but I think it's because they have parents that have, if it's successful, that have learned to be intentional with the subjects their children are, list, are interested in. Um, but I personally, I'm not an unschooler. I'm a scheduled schooler, a parent-led schooler, because I think that's what the Bible teaches, is that parents are to lead the, the education of their children. See, students may not decide to do this on their own, because the, the learning and the review and the hear, learn, keep, do thing that I've been talking about today is not easy. I've been telling you, require effort, make it hard, raise the bar, tell them they can do it. Students aren't likely to choose that on their own. Maybe as we grow older in our lives, we as mothers can discipline ourselves to do hard things, 
and to continue to learn things even when we are tired. Maybe I can discipline myself to stay awake a little bit longer or to refresh my memory the next morning about what I read so that it sticks with me. But because students may not decide to do this on their own, do lead, do be the mom, do what God says and teach your children, which requires self-discipline. So you need to first make your choice and write it on your hand and your forehead that I will do this. It will be hard. I will have to raise the bar for myself. I will have to learn how to learn. And you know what I'm going to tell you to do? I'm going to tell you to get that book I told you about. Make it stick, The Science of Successful Learning. I highly recommend it. Other books I've recommended in previous conferences, go back and watch those videos. Go back to school on how to be a good teacher. We have a page on our website. You can get to it on pretty much any page of our sites. Um, it's called Teacher Training. And we have right now, as of the end of this year, we will have probably 90 to 100 videos, most of them quite long, on how to be a teacher. There is no excuse, but you have to make time for it and you have to learn. Go to school, mom. Learn how to be a teacher and you will have a fantastic homeschooling. Uh, let me see if I missed anything. Um, why is homeschooling best? Why are we homeschooling and why do I believe it's the best method? I actually had a conversation with my husband about this recently. I said, honey, in the kingdom, well, we have schools again. And here was my logic. I said, we probably will. Because first of all, it's really difficult for mom to spread herself so thin. It seems like some days I just don't do anything well. I do a lot of things, but nothing is well. And so I feel like a failure. And in our society, we are taught to specialize, to be good at one thing, and then go to everyone else who is, a specialized, who is specializing in those things and let them to them. And, and I see the value economically in that. You know, if someone's really good at making bread, why would I make my own bread when it's just kind of meh? I could go to that person and I could get fantastic bread. Or I could send my child to that teacher over there because she's a fantastic teacher. And so we were talking about that in the millennium. Won't, socialization won't be a problem. Yeshua is going to rule with a rod of iron. Our kids could go to school and not have to worry about having bad companions. Everyone's going to be on the same page, same calendar, the same ways of pronouncing things. At least that's the way my brain was thinking. Except for the fact that I went back today, this morning, before I got on video, and I read Deuteronomy again, Deuteronomy 6, and it says, these words which I command you today are to be on your heart and you shall teach them to your children. Why is homeschooling better? Why does Yehovah make it so hard on us moms? Why can't I send my kid off to some other teacher? Why wouldn't they be better? That person's so much better at it than I am. Here's why. Nobody knows your child like you know your child. And one of the things I said earlier is that one of the ways we learn best is by connecting today's new, t new concept with previous learning. You go put your child into a classroom and that teacher does not have the context. They have not known your child since the day he was born. And that child or that teacher will try really hard to make up new context and that will work to a point, but the mother and the father will always have the advantage they know their child like nobody else and they have time yeah I know you're really busy you have a lot to do we're gonna talk about some like strategies for getting some of that stuff done as we go throughout this week and we get back to the basics of how do you get a meal on the table and get homeschooling done but you can talk to your children while you get a meal on the table you can talk to your children a lot and nobody else has that much time and if you're disciplined and put little sticky notes to remind you to review things, you know, you can customize your child's quizzes and tests. You can customize their notebooking pages. And this is why I tend to dig my heels in as a curriculum writer and not give you that much information about how to quiz your children and how to test them and how to do this. Teachers in a classroom would need this. We have a school that's using our curriculum over in Myanmar. And they are teaching 650 children with homeschooling Torah. And they probably need a test because they, they're doing it by Zoom and they can't even get into the class, the homes of these children except through that camera. They're at a distinct disadvantage. 
that you as a mom will never have this problem because you can quiz your children over things that you know they, this one individual student needs. And if you mom are disciplined and careful with your time and cheerful and thankful and understand the concepts of why you need to learn these things, you can do a better job than anyone else on the planet. And I suspect that's not gonna change in the kingdom. I could be wrong, I haven't been there before, but I kinda think that if Yehovah thought in the time of Deuteronomy, and he never changes, right? That parents are the best ones to teach their children, I suspect that's gonna continue. So I urge you to become a better teacher. Teach your children how to be teachers so that they will do a great job with your grandchildren and they will pass on. So you can do this, mom. Learn how to learn yourself. Go get some books, some training, some videos. Trust in the Father to prompt you as you go through your day. And remember, your student is getting the highest class education that is possible as long as you'll do it his way. Hear, learn, keep, and do.